Hey everybody, welcome to the Bridge the Gap DFS podcast. Thank you everybody that tuned in earlier this week for our interview with CS Maniac. We're getting a ton of great feedback. And one of my goals with with the website, with the YouTube, with everything, is just to do something different. You know, I think it's really fun getting excited about NFL season this time of year. And there's a lot of content out there. Most of it's the same, and it gets a little old, it gets a little boring. And most of the content you're going to see the next couple of weeks is, oh, you should draft this guy in this round, or this guy's a, a good fantasy value, or this, and it's, it, it doesn't really matter. It's all noise. We don't know how it's going to take, we don't know how it's going to transpire once the games take place. So one of the things I want to do is just bring on the people in my life that I know who are just passionate about their team and ask them questions that are relevant to the fantasy landscape. We don't need to know, hey, this guy's getting drafted in this round. That's not that important. But being able to dig a little deeper, um, because heading into our drafts in a couple weeks, this is going to be important, but more so some of the stuff we're going to need to remember for later in the year as depth charts change, as injuries take place. So I really just want to go team by team and ask a handful of questions with the experts in my life that know them the best. So without further ado, we're going to kick off today's coverage with the Oakland Raiders. We have my really good buddy, uh, Lance Brody. He's a lifelong Raider fan, and we've got some questions for him today. Lance, how you doing, buddy? I'm doing great, Gus. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. You got it, man. I'm, I'm, I'm really excited to do this, and I, I reached out to you, and you were fired up about it, and you are the person in my life that knows and, and loves the Raiders the most, so I, I appreciate you being here, man. Um, we I don't know if you know this, but we will have... Um, been friends uh 15 years later this month it's our 15 year anniversary this month and i didn't even get a bracelet what the hell what does that say about our relationship i have a couple weeks i have a couple weeks it's not it's not uh it's not uh (laughs) fall 15 just yet so lance and i go back to college and it's just one of the he's the type of guy in my life that um when we met it was this in this year to be friends for life and why where why haven't we been friends sooner so Um, Just been a great guy. And why don't you tell us, Lance, about your history as a Raiders fan, and we'll go from there. Well, you know, the history as a Raiders fan, it all began probably like around kindergarten, which would have been 89, 1990. Um, A couple different things made me a Raiders fan. One of them, obviously, Tech Mobile with Bo Jackson. Anybody who's ever played that game, especially our generation, Bo Jackson was unstoppable, unbeatable. He was probably the most popular athlete in the world at the time because Jordan wasn't even winning championships yet. So it was Bo Jackson. And then, you know, my dad grew up a Raiders fan. You know, he kind of liked both Bay Area teams, but more so the Raiders. Um, Granted, they were in L.A. back in 89. And and then he had these cool old school bleacher seats that you like. They were like wooden almost with the cushion that had the pop-up back. And it had the it had the L.A. Raiders emblem on the back, and they always sat in the garage, and I freaking was obsessed with them, like just the emblem, the shield, the pirate, like the colors, everything was just so cool. So as a little kid, like those are the things. It's like, oh, I like this team now, you know. Even though obviously the 49ers were the obvious better team at that time period, everybody was a 49ers fan. Like I wanted to be a little different, even though don't get me wrong, Niners were fun to watch and they were phenomenal back then. Hall of Fame players up the wazoo. Like I like the Renegades, I like the Raiders, and so ever since then, that's just how it's been. You know, and I grew up the opposite. I loved the Niners, hated the Raiders, and but I agree with you. The league is so much better when both of those teams are are good. And you know, as you get older and you become more of a football fan, you you care less about rivalries to a certain extent, to where you can appreciate what they are. And you know, one of the uh, best books I ever read was the book that that John Madden, the biography that someone wrote about him, and it just gave me a total uh, appreciation and respect for for the organization as a whole. And even Al Davis, you know, we pretty much saw most of Al Davis in his later years when things were falling apart a little bit. But the guy literally changed the game. Um, you know, I think that um, I'm a bit rebellious, so you know, the autumn wind is a pirate, the autumn wind is a raider, and you know, I definitely appreciate the Raiders a heck of a lot more now as just a football fan than I than I did as a kid you know hating their guts so um, welcome to the show and let's dive right in so we have Derek Carr in year two of, of Gruden's offense anytime you have a, a a new coach come in to the picture especially one with like Gruden that had so much on his plate last year I think he got a pretty bad rap for some of the moves that he made we're seeing that some of them weren't that bad you and I were talking yesterday about you know if the Bears don't win a title in Trubisky's rookie window 
the Mac trade's not that that big of a deal, and they cleared a bunch of cap room and got some some picks. But offensively, it can be a challenge when you have a new coach that is as offensively mastered as Gruden is, and that can take more than a year with a quarterback like Carr, you know, adapting to a new system, um, new weapons everywhere. So what is your expectation of Carr in year two in Gruden's offense? Well, yeah, definitely, like you said, Gruden is, you know, he's more old school, but his offenses are rather complex. They're not figured out overnight. Um, Carr, he's a smart quarterback. He's going to figure it out. Um, I think personally Carr can dominate in Gruden's offense as long as him and his teammates, you know, get it down, get it figured out. Um, I think Carr, honestly, is going to have one of his better years. I'm not saying it's going to be 2016 all over again, but, you know, statistically last year he didn't have a very bad year. If you look at the numbers as numbers, you know, he almost threw 70% completions. You know, he he had over 4,000 yards, but his touchdowns were down immensely. You know, Gruden, I think, is going to fix it. I think he's going to get – he obviously got Carr the weapons this year in the offseason so Carr can succeed. I mean, you go and you get Antonio Brown. I I absolutely loved that signing. You know, yeah, we paid him a ton of money, but it's freaking Antonio Brown. Like, the guy is a player. He's ready to get it done. He wants to play with Carr. You know, um, I'm I'm ecstatic about that. I can't wait to see Antonio Brown in a Raiders uniform. Um, You went and grabbed Terrell Williams. I mean, that guy – you know, he's a great deep threat. I was actually surprised the Chargers let him go. Um, I know they got Mike Williams, but I was really happy when the Raiders swooped him up. And then they went and drafted little Hunter Renfro out of Clemson. I love Hunter Renfro. He dominated at Clemson. He was that sneaky slot receiver, little Julian Edelman in college. And if he's used properly, he could very well be that in the pros. I don't know if he's going to be that. That's obviously a high ceiling. But all those three receivers right there, in my opinion, are going to help Carr get back to kind of 2015, 2016 numbers, you know, throwing more touchdowns, and he's just going to be a better player, in my opinion. Well, and we we chat, you know, about the Raiders' prospects this year. We're both expecting, you know, hey, we're not – expecting the world we're definitely expecting some progress and the main Achilles heel for the Raiders it seems like the defense is still going to be a work in progress which for fantasy purpose is is great because we could have a scenario with Carr where he um, eclipses what he's done the last couple years but if you know we run into a scenario like we saw two years ago where when they were in so many close games um, we could see some shootouts, and this offense, I think, is built to shoot out, which is is tremendous for for Carr's upside. and And I think that you know him being drafted as kind of an afterthought is is a mistake. I think he's going to have you know good value a handful of weeks this year. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I've 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 been reading some of the value things and where people project Carr to go, and I, I think they're completely disrespecting him. I mean, they've they've got Josh Allen ranked higher than Derek Carr. I don't even understand who's doing that. You know, you were joking with me that I should call ESPN Fantasy and talk to who's in charge. Um, but, yeah, you know, Derek, he obviously has regressed a bit since his big Christmas Eve injury, um, you know, breaking his ankle as badly as he did. You know, he checks down quicker. I mean, I personally think he is a little bit scared back there. But to his defense, his offensive line has regressed. His offensive line in the last few years has gotten worse than where it was in 2016. Donald Penn is constantly hurt, and he's gone now. Kalecchio Semele was hurt a lot last year. Um, you know, Rodney Hudson really has been the only rock of that offensive line that does his job day in and day out. Everybody else is kind of all over the place, a little sketch. You know, they got rid of Osemele this year. He went to the Jets because, you know, they were making cap space to sign other players. And the only thing, in my opinion right now, on that O-line – that is Carr's biggest Achilles heel is Colton Miller. I think he's a garbage left tackle. I don't understand why. I think Gruden drafted him, even though McKenzie was the GM. That's a Gruden pick to me. Um, I just, that, you know, I love Gruden. I think he's an intelligent coach. Drafting Colton Miller for Derek Carr in the, in the first round made absolutely no sense to me. And his play last year as a rookie proved it. And yeah, I've read he's been hurt and all this nonsense, blah, blah, blah. Regardless, the guy was on the field. He said he could play, and he was terrible. He's arguably the worst tackle in the NFL. So for Carr to succeed, that O-line's got to get better. And if it gets better and gets kind of closer to that 2016 form, then, yeah, there's no reason why he won't be, you know, a 2016-esque Derek Carr. You know, he's smart. He knows where to throw the ball. He's accurate. 
But if he's getting pressured every you know few seconds, then he's not going to be able to get the ball to his weapons. And Antonio Brown needs Derek Carr to have more than two to three seconds back there for him to get the numbers that we're expecting out of Antonio Brown. And I do want to talk more about the receivers, but before we get into them, I want to um, get into the running back situation. Um, you and I are just foaming at the mouth at what – a running back in a Gruden offense can do. You know, you and I started playing fantasy around the same time. Uh, Charlie Garner back in 2001 was just, he was a little back. He was kind of a scat back before, but Gruden turned him, to, in, turned him into a bell cow. And he was the, you know, they ran a lot of single back. Um, you know, Richie was involved in the offense. Tim Brown, Jerry Rice, Rich Gannon. That offense was clicking. I think that they're building a model similar to that. And if they can... We're looking at, you know, that year Charlie Garner had almost 1,800 yards or over 1,800 yards, I think 11 touchdowns, 90 catches. It was the first year I ever played PPR, and it was just the best thing ever because he was just all over the place involved in everything on the down on the field, every single down. So as fantasy players, we really want that. We weren't able to see that last year with, with Gruden's running backs, and I don't think it was because he didn't want to see that. I think he wanted to see that, but Marshawn got hurt. Doug Martin got hurt. They're less left to uh, Jalen Richard. Uh, Washington saw some time, so it was kind of a mess. It was kind of a logjam. Uh, Lynch is gone. Um, Doug Martin's back, but they they spent an early pick on Josh Jacobs. Do we have an opportunity to see Josh Jacobs develop into the Charlie Garner role? Is it going to take more time? What is your thought and outlook on the running back scenario headed into the season? Well. First of all, Josh Jacobs, I love the pick at 24. You know, I've told you this in the last few weeks. He's an excellent talent. He's exactly what the Raiders offense needs at the moment. You know, as you just stated, they haven't had a premier tailback that can do it all since Charlie Garner. Yeah, you know, they've had Derek Mason had an okay years here and there. You know, some, some random decent seasons with some guys. But Charlie Garner... And for per fantasy football was the perfect running back. He could catch the ball. He was fast. He can get open in space. I mean, I was actually watching some highlights a few days ago of Charlie Garner, and he just blew my mind. I mean, he was he was you know Ladanian Tomlinson esque before Ladanian Tomlinson hit the scene. Not as good as LT, obviously. You know, people don't jump down my throat, but he he could just do it all. Josh Jacobs has that talent. Is he going to do it? Obviously, nobody knows. You know, Alabama running backs have been pretty subpar in the last 10 years getting drafted in the NFL. Um, that doesn't mean Josh Jacobs is going to fall into that trap. But I see that he's going to have a decent year. He's going to be expected to jump right into the deep end and sink a swim. He, they grabbed the first-round pick with him. They're expecting big things. Doug Martin and Jalen Richard, they're just, you know, the minor insurance in case something bad happens to them. Um, I fully expect Jacobs to kind of have, you know, seven, 800 rushing yard year, you know, get close to 10 total touchdowns, maybe even eclipse them if he's used properly in the passing game. And yeah, he's going to catch passes out of the backfield. You know, he might get 30 to 50 receptions, 300, 400 yards. I mean, if he plays all 16 games and stays healthy, there's no reason why Josh Jacobs can't finish in the top 10 of fantasy running backs. I mean, but again, he's got to be healthy and he's got to be used properly. And Gruden knows how to use tailback. He's, he's an offensive guru. He knows what he's doing. And, you know, Carr, as we've seen, checks down the ball a lot when he's pressured. Well, if Josh Jacobs is in the game, he's going to see a lot of check downs. He's going to get the receptions that Jalen Richard was getting last year. You know, he'd sneak in his 10 to 12 PPR points every week because that's all Derek did was throw to the tailback and the tight end all game long because he had no protection. So, you know, the, the ceiling is pretty high for Josh Jacobs. You know, where he's going to land, who knows but he definitely could be a Charlie Garner at tailback early. Well, and I, and I like what you said about the Alabama backs, and I think there's something that's distinctly different about Jacobs versus, you know, Trent Richardson and um, Eddie Lacy and even Derrick Henry to a certain extent. You know, all these guys, everybody had big expectations. These guys are going to be bell cows. These are going to be the next Sean Alexanders in the league. And we're not really hearing that much about Josh Jacobs. He, he's kind of quietly entering, about as quiet as an Alabama running back taken in the first round could enter the league is what he's doing. So I definitely think that if there are some question marks surrounding, surrounding the area that are scaring other people off of Josh Jacobs, I completely agree with you. I think that 
you know, we talk about a lot of times in playing fantasy is the, the path to victory, the path to victory, the path to this job, the path to Josh Jacobs being very successful is is there. And, you know, Hard Knocks is going to start next week. And typically guys on Hard Knocks, especially when they look good, are going to get overdrafted. So if J- Jacobs doesn't look that good the next couple of weeks, I think that he could be a steal at some point, knowing that it might take him a couple extra weeks to to get it going. He might bust. We don't know, but I think that that's part of the the thing of being a successful fantasy player is not really having a bias, just being able to take a look at the range of outcomes. Hey, if it goes poorly, this could happen. If it goes great, this could happen. It's probably going to end somewhere in between. But you know, the the more I play fantasy, the better I get. Is not because I know more. It's because I I don't care to be as right as often. You know, if we're going into our drafts and we got to have Josh Jacobs, you know we could hurt the rest of our draft. But hey, if we're building our team and we're looking for a second or third running back and he's still there at a good value, that's how you win leagues. That's how you win championships. So I, I, I'm, I'm just as optimistic about Jacobs as you are. And I think that if there were an opportunity for, you know, back out of Alabama to make an impact early for the first time in a long time, I definitely think it's, it's Jacobs. Now, moving into, um, you know, the, the, the topic that everybody wants to hear more about is these wide receivers. You know, everybody is looking at the Amari Cooper situation. They traded him away. And, you know, Carr's had weapons before, and, you know, he has. What Cooper is a good receiver, but not the caliber of Antonio Brown, not the fit like Antonio Brown. You know, Antonio Brown is the closest thing to Jerry Rice that we've seen probably ever and may never see again. He's definitely a once-in-a-generation player. Raiders got him, didn't pay a high price to do so, actually made a great deal in getting him, and he's here we talked you touched on Tyrell you touched on Renfro walk us through a little bit more in depth of what do you see from this receiving core what do you see on a target to target basis and are any of the guys you know the JJ Nelsons the Aitmans the Ryan Grants are any of these guys worth being on our radar this year so yeah you know the Raiders wide receiver groups fantasy wise I think all of them have giant question marks except Antonio Brown of value and what they're going to produce. Antonio Brown is going to get his targets. They're paying him money. You know, they gave their future star wide receiver away to get him and gained a first round pick. I mean, I thought the Raiders came away in a giant deal in that trade. Yeah, Amari Cooper dominated with the Cowboys. But you go and get Antonio Brown and a first rounder you know, and pay him a bunch of money, but he's going to be your target. He's going to be your guy. So I fully expect Antonio Brown to get his, you know, 70 to 90 receptions. I don't really see him surpassing 100 because he's going to be keyed in on a lot. But as we know, he's pretty unguardable. So I I expect him to get his 70 to 90 catches over a 1,000 yard receiving and, you know, possibly 10 or more touchdowns, maybe realistically 8 to 9, but it's Antonio Brown. He could end up with 16 in the blink of an eye. You know, he's that good. Terrell Williams, amazing deep threat wide receiver. I mean, he can get open. The question for him is, is Carr going to have the time to let his routes develop? The O-line has got to protect him. If the O-line protects him, Terrell Williams could have a monster season because people are going to have to key in on Brown. He's going to get double teamed. And if Carr gets his four to five seconds to let Terrell's routes develop, boom, that guy's going to have, you know, Kenny Stills on steroids numbers. You know, he could get... 50 receptions, but the big averaging 15 to 20 yards of catch plays, making the big touchdown plays in the game on first down when they play action and go deep. I mean, it's the O, Terrell's success is based on the O line. That's how I equate it with Terrell Williams. The slot wide receiver rule is completely wide open. They picked Hunter Renfro. I'm praying that he wins the job in camp. But you've got Ryan Grant and J.J. Nelson who are going to fight for that spot. They're veteran wide receivers. They can play. They can catch. I really don't think they're the answer in that position. To me, they're band-aid players. Just kind of plug them in and hope they get some stats. So, you know, you drafted Hunter Renfro for a reason. If he, if he was in New England, he, he would have a great year. Bill Belichick is a slot wide receiver guru. And Hunter Renfro, I, I don't understand why more teams just don't copy Bill Belichick's model. The slot wide receiver, to me, is the most valuable wide receiver role in the entire NFL, and the Patriots have proved it for almost two decades two decades now that you don't need an Antonio Brown wide receiver to win a Super Bowl. They 
ton of these Super Bowls with these little tiny short white guys that dominate and go in MVPs, the Danny Amendola's, the Julian Edelman. The Wes Welker didn't win a Super Bowl, but Wes Welker was one of the most dominant flat wide receivers in the history of the NFL. So the position works, and more teams don't use it properly, and it, it just baffles me. So the receiving core for Carr, they definitely have the talent to be successful and make their offense a top 10 NFL offense. Again, is it going to happen? Give Carr some time and he'll do it. He's, he's a great quarterback. He's a previous Pro Bowl quarterback. Just, you know, protect him and he won't have to dump the ball to just the running backs and the tight end every other play, you know. So the whole success of the game, obviously, is the O-line for the Raiders. And I'm going to say it all football season long. It's up to the O-line. It's up to the O-line. They never get any credit when teams are successful. And, you know, they are without a doubt, besides the quarterback, the most important people on the field. Yeah, and, and, you know, you look at the teams that win the Super Bowl every single year, there's always something in common with them. They're strong in the trenches offensively and defensively. They can protect the quarterback on offense. They can rush it on defense. And, you know, the other thing that I like about Renfro is, you know, he's probably going to get – some criticism for his size is probably why he dropped in the draft. But you're absolutely right. You know, why aren't more of these teams doing things like the Patriots? If you want to make a move, just ask yourself, would Bill Belichick do this? And, you know, I don't know if he would have traded for Antonio Brown. That's not really what he does. But for the deal that they got, I think that he would sign off on that. And then you take a guy like Renfro. The other thing that's amazing about Renfro is he's been in some really big games. He is the guy that caught the game-winning touchdown pass when Clemson was, you know, almost a 7, 8, 9, 10-point underdog against Alabama in the title game a few years ago. So he has the pedigree to, to be competitive. And I, I think you're right. You know, we're going to talk about the tight ends next, and it's kind of a log jam. So, you know, if – you're not able to check down to a tight end or they're struggling to replace Cook's role, I think Renfro, Renfro would be very, very applicable as, as a piece that they could, you know, run those five-yard in and outs, um, you know, that, that, dig, that dig route that, that Edelman and Amendola always run. I think that's going to be there for him, the outs. Um, I, I, I think that his role could be very, very much in line with what we see in New England with the Welker and Edelman, and not just because he's a tiny, <laughs> a tiny white guy. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and I mean, before we jump to the tight ends, I personally always felt that Amari Cooper should have been used more in the slot with the Raiders. He, he, a lot of his receptions out of Alabama were from the slot position. And yeah, he had his deep balls where, you know, the team would try to stack the box on Bama to stop Henry, and he would run a quick, you know, double move or something, and he would break and take off. And that's when, um, I can't remember which man of quarterback it was back then, if it was even Jalen Hurts or previously. But, um, you know, he hit him deep because he would get behind the safeties. But Amari would run a lot of short routes, and he, he had the hands and he could catch the ball. And if you look, a lot of his plays that were successful in Dallas last year, Dak threw him five- to seven-yard routes. He was not going deep. And then Amari made the play in the open field. And it looked like Terrell Owens on the Cowboys on some of those plays where he just got open, he was running like a gazelle. And I always felt the Raiders misused him. You know, he he had great staff in 2015 and 2016, and they had Crabtree to, you know, catch some of the more, me, you know, medium-level routes. But I always saw him more as a big slot-wide receiver, and there's no reason why he shouldn't have been getting 10 receptions a game. And now he's gone. Yeah, we got Antonio Brown. I'm happy. But I just – I can't stand it when a guy dominates at something in college, and then he goes to a team and they're like, well, we want you to do this. It's like, why did you draft me then? You know, this is what I'm good at, and you're changing my style of play. I, I always felt he should have been a five- to eight-yard um, route receiver for the Raiders. And that is what it is now. Well, and I agree with you, and I and I, I don't understand why, you know, with the slot there's a lot more room to operate. You're picking up on nickel corners. You're forcing the, the stud cornerback out of his comfort zone of playing on the outside. You might get coverage against a linebacker. Um, I definitely think that, you know, Cooper was misused prior to Gruden. Maybe they tried to make it work and it just wasn't there. Maybe, you know, Cooper saw, you know, the the rebuild that they were looking at, not wanting to be a part of it. So, you know, it's a it's a rare trade that actually works out for for both teams. Sure. And I, think- I, I guess I guess Reggie McKenzie felt Seth Roberts was the better option. <laughs> I have no idea. Oh my God! I've got uh, yeah. I've got plenty to say about Seth Roberts here in a couple of weeks when I start getting into some of the, <laughs> the daily fantasy stuff. But um, we've got 
quite a few guys at tight end with NFL experience. None of these guys are really known for for being pass catchers. A lot of these guys are blocking guys. They're serviceable pass catchers, but, you know, it's uh, Jared Cook is, you know, a Lamborghini at the tight end position. Fire him up, and, you know, he's kind of like a Gronkowski light. He's now in New Orleans. What do we make about this tight end situation? We know that, that Gruden can, you know, in his West Coast tempo, West Coast offense typically can feed and make a productive position out of tight end for fantasy purposes. But looking at some of the names here, nothing really gets me excited. So what are you thinking that they're going to do at tight end this year? Yeah, you know, tight end to me is the big, just nobody knows with the Raiders. The, the names are... I hate to say this about them, but to nobody. And you got Darren Waller, you got Luke Wilson, you got a couple other random guys, like you said, years of experience, but nobody has, you know, it really impressed. And I don't see the tight end position really being a huge impact for the Raiders this year. They got a lot of mouths to feed at other positions. Um, you'll, you'll probably have a guy that does like a 30 to 40 reception year, three touchdowns, like, you know, just. 400 yards, 500 yards receiving, if that. I just don't see them using the tight end like they were Jared Cook. Jared Cook was probably the number one looked at target for Derek last year simply because he knew he didn't have a lot of time to throw the ball. Get the ball to Jared. He's what, six foot seven? Is that how tall he is? He's a monster on the field. Um, he's tall. And I just I don't see the tight end being a big thing for the Raiders this year. I hope I'm wrong. I hope one of these guys steps up and, you know, maybe listens to this podcast and says, hey, that Lance Road is an idiot. I really do. But um, my gut is just telling me that it's going to be a pretty big non-factor in the receiving game. Um, But, you know, I've read some reports that they really like Darren Waller. But then again, you know, in stinking preseason, everybody likes everybody. You don't ever hear a coach – when he's being interviewed, say, shoot, I don't even know why we have this guy on the roster right now. I think he sucks. You know, they would say, oh, yeah, I like some of the things he's doing. He has a good opportunity to be a, a great player. Um, so, yeah, I just – I don't I, I don't have big hopes for the tight end at Oakland this year. Well, and we'll get a good look the next couple of weeks. That's one of the things I think that, you know, you can't gleam everything from – from hard knocks, but just being able to, you know, see if there's any involvement, get a peek behind the scenes. And I think you're right. I think we will see a by committee. I think it will be productive, but unless somebody is, you know, really asserting themselves, you know, the, the Luke Wilson's, these guys, the the carriers, like they're consummate pros. Like they're, they're going to be on the field just for their blocking ability alone. But, you know, I think we might see, you know, a, a handful of, um, old school use of the tight end to to block out of you know the pro and i formation and then when they go to three wides you know they they could even open up with four wides because you have you know tyrell williams so you can stretch the field so can jj nelson so it's, it's going to be very interesting i really think that you know we will see some progression with with gruden gruden does get a bad rap it's fun to make fun of him um but i i think that we will see you know at least quite a bit of improvement this year and year two so Lance I really appreciate you man I'm very thankful for for you coming on the show I'd love to have you on in the future to cover all things Raiders anything taking place in Stockton California and anything else you want to chat about buddy yeah no definitely um I was very excited when you asked me to be on the show you know you know me I love talking about my Raiders yeah the last you know, God, since 2003, however many years that is, 16 years, 17 years of NFL seasons, it's been um, pretty gut-wrenching to have to watch and deal with. But, again, you live and die with your teams. Been a Raiders fan for freaking 30 years now. Yeah, this will be 30 years, 89. And, um, you know, I've only maybe seen five years, six years of them being Super Bowl competitive caliber type teams. So that's a lot of 25, 24 years of uh, – pretty mediocre to bad stuff but you know it's football season you know as we get older i think you're right i think the rivalry stuff and everything dies down as you get older and you just want to see good football and you know that's what i want to watch and that's why i love playing fantasy football because you focus on teams that are not your own team you're just not some ignorant homer you know you just want to watch good football and see big plays and be entertained and that's what it is it's entertainment it's in the entertainment business and I think a lot of fans forget that when they take everything so personally when all these players do stuff and everybody hits their Twitter. It's like, dude, these guys are in their 20s. They're millionaires. They're going to do dumb things. Their job is to entertain you and talk. You know, it's, it's 
WWF if it was real. You know, football players actually hit each other. It's a real sport. It's a real game. Um, so, yeah, you know, I think just people need to enjoy it more and not take it so personally. And I agree with you, man, and that's, that's exactly right. The older I get, the more I just kind of want to root for my fantasy teams, you know, you know, love your family, like your team kind of a thing. Well, Lance, I appreciate you, man. I'm excited to see you in a couple of weeks. We have our, our, our live in-person draft. Just booked my flight to head out there, and um, very excited to see you, buddy. Thank you again for taking the time to do this. Yeah, have a good one, Gus. All right, bye. Love you, buddy. Your call has been forwarded to an automated voice messaging system. Five five nine nine zero seven two four. Let's try it again, Grant. I think he's ready. I just texted him. Hello. Gilbert. Hey, can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you perfect. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you just fine. I'm, I've got the uh, Bluetooth on in the car. I just want to make sure it doesn't sound like muffled or anything. No, man, we're we're good. We're going to hop right into it. Um, everybody, I wanted to introduce one of my really good friends, uh, Gil. He is a lifelong Seahawks fan, and I was telling him about this, this project, and he got pretty fired up about it. He's like, wait a second, so it's just going to be like, two buddies talking about football like if we were at the bar i'm like exactly that that's exactly what i want i want the unfiltered content from from real fans and i want them to be able to just say the things that we can't get from from beat writers so gil welcome to the show buddy i'm very excited to have you here why don't you kick us off by telling us about um you know your history as a as a seahawks fan yeah man thanks for thanks for having me man i'm really excited to be here um so, where I grew up, it was either you were a 49ers fan or a Raiders fan, and uh, I couldn't really, I don't know, I couldn't really buy into either of those teams. Sorry, man. <laughs> it's, uh, um, I really didn't pay attention to the NFL that much. Um, I started playing football, I want to say like around seventh grade, and college football was like the big thing uh where i grew up so we kind of paid attention to that and specifically the players so one of the players that really stood out to me was sean springs this was around like 1995 1996 1997 and he was a cornerback for ohio state and he was an absolute stud so i used to just love watching him play and uh eventually when he declared for the draft the seahawks picked him up i think they took him third overall in like 97 and uh I just started following him on the Seahawks, and, and I think Warren Moon was uh, the quarterback at the time, and I just started watching Warren Moon play and just started reading more about the Seahawks, and I found out about Steve Largent, and I was like, man, this guy's pretty good. Uh, Jerry Rice was, was the, the talk of the town at the time. He was the, the elite receiver at the time, but you know what? Jerry Rice had to break Steve Largent's records to become the GOAT. So um, I, just, I had an appreciation of Largent and – Moon, Springs, uh, eventually uh, Holmgren went over there, and Hasselbeck, uh, Sean Alexander. It was like a, a team full of, like, misfits that, like, nobody wanted, and they had, like, a chip on their shoulders. So I, I could appreciate that because I kind of felt the same way <laughs> at the time as well. So uh, I just started watching them, and, you know, it's been a, a lifelong experience of ups and downs, but, you know, we, we finally got that Super Bowl against the Broncos, which was nice. You know, it was a heartbreak the next year, but – you know, uh, so that's basically my my history as a as a Seahawks fan in a nutshell. I mean, I could spend all day talking about him, but to well, answer your question, that's it. It's funny because you know this this fall will be the 20 year anniversary of us being friends. I don't know if you know that. Congratulations, we made it. 
Um, Gil- yeah, man. <laughs> Gilbert was one of the best men in my wedding, and you know it was funny because like we would get together and we'd play fantasy together and we'd talk sports and we would just hang out. You know, every day it was go to school, an after school job. I'd go there for a couple hours and then I'd go over to my buddy Nick's house and then Gilbert, myself, Nick, and his brother, and we just play video games and talk football from six to eleven almost every single night after school. And it was funny because. Whenever we'd play Madden Guild, we'd pick the Seahawks, and you know we'd be like, "Dude, how can you, how can you root for this team?" Because we all grew up Niner fans, and we're just like, "Your team sucks." And it's like, who's laughing now? Because the Seahawks have been a much better ran organization than than the Niners uh, the last twenty years. And so, um, yeah, but oh, that's the a, tables have turned. They, they 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 very much have, and and that's you brought up a great, great point. You know. Jerry Rice did have to pass Steve Largent to be – if Jerry Rice breaks a leg or only gets halfway there, quarter, three-quarters of the way there, we're talking about Steve Largent as the greatest wide receiver of all time. And, you know, I don't think he's even considered in the top ten most of the time, which is a discredit to him. But let's get right into the fantasy, mm-hmm. the fantasy discussion. Um, I don't want to – talk about the traditional stuff that most of the other podcasts uh, YouTubes are going to be talking about. Hey, Russell Wilson's going to be a top 10 quarterback and blah, blah. It's like, I don't care about any of that. You know, everybody knows that. I want to talk about the stuff from an insider's perspective about some of the stuff that isn't really being talked about. And again, you know, I, I, I want the fans on the insiders of the people that I know, because they're going to be honest. They're going to be, you know, they love their team, but they can also tell you what they hate about their team. And, you know, one of the things we saw this off season is Doug Baldwin retiring seemingly unexpectedly. He had a bit of a down year, had some injury issues and Doug Baldwin's always made it very clear. He has a great life perspective, but how does this team uh, move forward without Doug Baldwin? Um, you know, especially with the other receivers and, and Russell Wilson. So it's it's going to be hard to replace the, the, the leadership that Doug Baldwin brings to the locker room and just the, that veteran presence. And he always seems to get open on third down. Uh, they, were, they were without him for, I think, the first six games of last season. I think they went about 500. So, I mean, they, they managed – um, eventually, when Baldwin came back, he ended the year with, I think, 50 receptions, about 600 yards, uh, five touchdowns. Now, Tyler Lockett and David Moore are perfectly capable of jacking up those kind of numbers. Actually, Tyler Lockett last year put up, uh, what, 57 receptions, like 900 yards and 10 touchdowns. So, I mean, he's, he's right there. Uh, I think they're going to be just fine. Uh, they got this DK Metcalf guy that they they drafted. I know a lot of people are are excited about him. The guy's a, a big receiver. He can take the top off the defense. He runs a four three forty. So if they can get him to run those deep patterns and and maybe get David Moore or, or Tyler Lockett involved underneath, I mean Lockett can also take the top off the defense as well. Um, I, I think they're going to be just fine, man. To be honest with you, um, I'm not too concerned with it. And then you got Russell Wilson there and there. I'll tell you. You know, <laughs> one of the uh, the most embarrassing moments as a Seahawks fan was uh, when the Packers were playing the, the Seahawks in the in the I think it was the wild card game, and you know everybody knows it goes to overtime, and then Hasselbeck's like, you know, we want the ball, and we're going to score, <laughs> and then he proceeds to immediately throw that interception to to freaking who is it? Al Harris takes it to the house, the game's over, and you know it, it, it was a it was a super low for me, and that. That team, that that era right there for like a three or four year stretch, we would get as the Seahawks fans, we we would get super frustrated because they couldn't convert on third down. The, the receivers would seem to always get a case of the dropsies. You know, Gerald Jackson was a good receiver, but he would drop the ball a lot. Corn Robinson, uh, Bobby Ingram was was arguably probably the most reliable receiver, but even even he would would drop passes a lot. Uh, now watching Russell Wilson. Um, I take it back to another Packers uh, Seahawks playoff game where it just it seemed like the Packers had it in the bag, but just Russell Wilson pulls out that that Houdini Fran Tarkenton magic and just brings them back to win the game. I, I still remember it. You know, Russell Wilson's like bawling his eyes out at the end of the game because he just he, he leaves it all out on the field. And as a fan, when I watch it now, I I don't have that feeling of oh my gosh, like. You know, this this could be it. This is over. This is the end of the season. They're not going to convert here. Now it's there's there's always hope. As long as you got Russell Wilson there, uh, I honestly I don't think it matters who you throw in at receiver, man. You can throw in DK Metcalf, uh, Darbo, DK. It, it doesn't matter. I think they're uh, they're going to be just fine. 
And I think you're right, man. It's I think that in the NFL, a lot of the times we see, you know, receivers that make their their quarterback better. You could definitely make the argument of something like that in in Pittsburgh. You know, and you know, Roethlisberger needed the guys that he's had to be great. Russell Wilson is one of the few guys like a Drew Brees, like a Tom Brady, that actually elevates the level of his play, like a, like a Peyton Manning. Everybody's better because of this guy. And, you know, Russell Wilson is just, like you said, it's like I don't know how he does it, but he just does it. And anytime I'm playing against Russell Wilson, whether that's in fantasy or if I have a bet against the Seahawks, like my you-know-what is puckered the whole entire game until it's final just because he <laughs> is just – he just – He's never afraid of the moment. He's always going to make a big play. He is. There's no way to really contain him. Like he's, you know, dangerous Russ Wilson for a reason. So I, I agree with you on that front. And it's going to be exciting because a lot of the things that we look for in fantasy is, you know, that that shroud of mystery when other people are afraid of a scenario and you're willing to take a shot. And if you're right, you're going to get some great values on these guys. So we'll touch a little bit more on the the wide receiver break breakout in a second. But I wanted to go back to the running back scenario. This running back roster is chock full of studs you know we, we have Carson they took Penny in the first round last year McKissick's been a great receiving back CJ Procise was drafted with high expectations and had that big game against the Patriots a few years ago Bo Scarborough is one of my favorite bruising running backs out of out of Alabama so we have a lot of pieces here we know they're going to be able to run the ball Chris Carson seemingly came out of nowhere last year to assert himself is he legit? Is is he the truth? Is are we going to see that again, or are we going to be looking at you know we don't know who's going to be the the guy this year, this week, you know this practice? What what's what's your take on the running back scenario this year? I I definitely think Chris Carson is legit. It it seemed at times that they were trying to force feed Rashad Penny towards the beginning of the season, and it just it wasn't working for him. I don't. I don't know if it, I know he had kind of a, a weight problem. Uh, maybe he just needed to get acclimated to the NFL and like the conditioning procedures and just, just how to be a professional. But uh, reading about stuff this off season, it seems like um, Rashad Penny's, uh, you know, he's, he's getting hyped up again. Uh, he's taking some different steps. I know he's hi- he hired a nutritionist. So I think you're going to see a, a, the same split, maybe a little bit more from Penny. Uh, they both averaged over four yards, four and a half yards a carry last year so they uh they were both pretty productive so i i just think it, it's whoever has the hot hand uh to be honest with you you know Pete carroll likes his two running backs back in usc when he had reggie bush and lundell white uh they're they're both very capable of, of shouldering the load so i'm uh, i'm excited to see rashad penny this year i was last year I was a little disappointed i know he was disappointed too so we'll see how resilient he is and just how much perseverance he has to to kind of come back and and show us, hey, this is why the Seahawks moved up to get me in the first round. So, so you touched on something that's really interesting, and I think it's important to to be thinking about this kind of stuff when we're approaching our drafts or we're building our lineups on a week to week basis. Is a lot of the times when you have a running back situation like this, where it's very divisive. Hey, no, it's Chris Carson. No, it's Rashad Penny. You're coming at it from the attitude of like. I'm rooting for both of these guys. I could see it playing out both of these ways, and I think that's incredibly smart. You know, you could be looking at a scenario in your draft where, um, you know, Chris Carson's a little undervalued. He won't be undervalued in our league because we have a guy who absolutely loves him and will overdraft him who's not a Seahawks fan, but that's a conversation for another day. (laughs) And then you have Rashad Penny who completely busted last year, but you – are looking past what everybody else is looking at. And we always say, you know, what do we know that no one else knows about or hasn't looked at? And you're like, this guy actually put up a great yard per carry average. He had some growing pains. He's showing some maturity in the off season by doing X, Y, and Z. And I got to be honest with you, I was completely ruling out Rashad Penny prior to your, your conversation um, insight that we just had. And I, I just got to commend you like that. That's, that's, that is true marksmanship as a fantasy player because Rashad Penny could be sitting there in the 12th, 13th round. I don't really know where he's going. I don't really care. But that could be a guy that wins leagues at the end of the year if something were to happen to Carson or, you know, if he we are looking at a hot hand approach or in daily fantasy, he might have a much cheaper salary that we can plug him in. So I really appreciate you saying that, Gilbert, because this is and this is why I wanted to have these conversations is because you're challenging the paradigm of what, you know, the consensus is and, you know, the – they say the asses are masses. The masses are asses. So, 
being able to challenge these paradigms <laughs> is what helps us become better, better players. Now, let's get back into the wide receivers. You know, we, we know about Tyler Lockett, and we've had big expectations for him. He, he rose to the challenge. He got a new contract. And, you know, after him, and I, and I agree with you, I think we, they're going to be just fine, but we have Metcalf who can take the lid off the defense. Gary Jennings Jr. is one of my favorite players in the draft out of West Virginia. They have David Moore, who was a Super Bowl star against the Patriots. Darbo was a guy that I really liked out of, out of Michigan. Um, what, how do you think this is going to shake out? Um, you know, I even see they have Keenan Reynolds, who played you know, quarterback at Navy. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of talent here. I just don't know where the pieces fit day one, especially when we've seen uh, Carroll. Um, they and not. I don't know if this is Carroll's mo. Maybe you can help us help us out with this. Is because we've seen Paul Richardson, Tyler Lockett, rookies that were drafted and expected to contribute right away, but they didn't really get it going until year two or three. You know, Lockett slowed some flashes his rookie year, battled some injuries. That was not the case for Paul Richardson. Um, what what do you make of this wide receiver core outside of outside of Lockett? I like I like David Moore. It seemed like the opportunities that he got, he he did a lot with. He has he definitely has big playability, and you know I I think he's going to take a take a big step forward this year. And I think this is what his second year. I think you know David Moore. Yeah. So it was he was. Correct me if I'm wrong. He was he made the impact in the Super Bowl out of nowhere against the Patriots, right? Or am I right. thinking someone else? Mm, no, I, I'm I'm pretty sure that was him. But I I I had him for a little while on my fantasy team last year. It just seemed like this dude had like two or three catches a game. But for there was like a three or four game stretch with like one of those catches, or I think even one game he had the two two touchdown game. But he, uh, I mean, I just I like the way he looks. He needs to probably refine his his, his route running a little bit because the the DB seem to really stick to him like glue. If he can kind of work on that, that'd be that'd be pretty awesome. But uh, I like I like this Metcalf kid. I, there was a, a video that came out on Twitter the other day uh, where he just kind of did like a move at the line. It was it was like a nine on nine drill, and and Russell Wilson just kind of lobbed it up to him and and uh, for a touchdown pass. And you know, there's a lot of a lot of comments. People were just like, "Oh yeah, that's great. You can do that against air, but try it against like a real DB in the NFL." You give this guy a chance uh, in the NFL just to kind of get some experience under his belt and he'll be doing that just like he was doing that to the air. So I'm excited about Metcalf. There's also this guy, uh, Ursula, I think if I'm pronouncing that correctly, I think he's from Hawaii. He's not a big dude. I think he's like five, nine, but he could easily get lost in the underneath stuff. Like to say, they just send like Lockett and freaking, uh, uh, Metcalf or even Jerome Brown's got, got a little bit of speed to him and, and people are probably going to lose sight of, of uh, a little Ursula there, he's, uh, you know, being five nine, um, so I'm excited to see that guy. It just it just depends, man. I know when when preseason comes around, they're going to play around, do a lot of receiver sets, and and it'll probably start out and be Lockett and Jerome Brown because you know Brown's the the veteran there. But you know, I think uh, after maybe like the third or fourth game of the season, we're going to start to see somebody emerge, and it's like, hey, look, Wilson's developing some chemistry with this guy, and he's proving that he can actually step up and replace the role that Baldwin was playing, and they're going to go from there. I think we're probably going to be surprised at the receiving core at the end of the year uh, of the Seahawks. But, I mean, they they are going to run the ball. They were first in rushing last year, so, they, you know, stick to what you're good at. And uh, just to, to touch on what you said earlier about you didn't know about Penny um, or just he wasn't on your radar, Penny actually ended the year with a higher yards per carry average than Carson did. So he kind of put it together towards the end of the season. That's why I'm kind of high on him. He finished great. And I think if he just had a had a do over, he's getting his do over right now in the second season. So I I'm super jazzed about him. Well, and you brought up some other other things I wanted to touch on really quick. You know, we we saw Jerron Brown show flashes in Arizona, and I totally overlooked um, Ursula on this team. And the only reason I know anything about Ursula is well, number one, we're Fresno State fans, but number two. I got into playing Daily Fantasy. They brought it back for the college game last year. And if you go to this guy's game log, um, he dominated 7 for 123, two touchdowns, 10 for 167, two touchdowns, 9 for 133, a touchdown, 13 for 148, three touchdowns. I think you might have found our sleeper there. I think you might have found our guy to keep an eye on because you, you want to see a receiver coming into the NFL to dominate his competition at the college level. And, yeah, it was the Mountain West. But that Hawaii team was so bad. And for him to put up those kind of numbers – 
tells me that I don't mm-hmm. need to know anything about this guy other than seeing what he did and come to the conclusion that he's got some slick to his game. So I think that, you know, Carroll and their front office has done a great job of finding some of these guys that are diamonds in the rough. And then a guy like DK Metcalf, you know, he is, like you said, I think that he's built to be as good at, as as advertised. He's got, a, you know, a frame similar to Calvin Johnson, you know, probably Megatron light, an inch shorter, maybe 10 pounds lighter. And he can take this as far as he wants to take it. But you also touched on, and I want to get into this really quick, is they're going to run the ball a lot. You know, talk to us a little bit more about Brian Schottenheimer. He's an awfully, uh, often criticized coordinator, kind of a, a, a you know, a, a joke, a butt of a joke when they hired him. What are your thoughts as a, as a fan, as him as a coordinator initially when he was hired? And has that changed since he's been hired? And what do you expect this year? Well, I mean, I was it was a, a breath of fresh air to see somebody different other than Bevel in there. Uh, it just seemed like Bevel was trying to get too cute at times. Uh, Schottenheimer just seems like a, hey, it's, a, it's clear cut. Hey, we're going to run the ball. This is what we're going to do. Um, we're going to run the ball first and second second down. We have Russell Wilson, so when it comes to, like, third and, and short, um, you know, we're, we're confident that he's going to convert. So I, I like what he's doing. He obviously likes to run the ball, and that's why I'm super excited about, you know, Carson-Penny duo. You know, Mike Davis is gone, so that's just – more at the table for for them to eat. JD McKissick, we'll see. Uh, we'll see if he can if he can actually contribute. Um, but Schottenheimer, I like what he's doing. I mean, the Seahawks were ten and six last year. Uh, they, I think, of the six losses, only one was was like eight points. All the rest of them were less than that. So there were some pretty close games. If they could just fine tune and, and find a way to to maybe convert those third downs and get a big stop uh, on third downs. And, you know, I, I like the Seahawks, to, you know, 11 and five. I don't think that's out of the realm of possibility, 11 and five, 12 and four, um, maybe fighting for that, that number two seed. Well, uh, you, but yeah, Schottenheimer, I, I love what he's doing. I like it. And I, I think you, you nailed on something that get, gets overlooked is, you know what, this is a pass happy league and everybody wants to watch Patrick Mahomes and the chiefs, you know, have the best offense and you go back to the greatest show on turf, but ultimately you have to keep teams out of the end zone and, you know, you can do that with, with ball control. And so I, I appreciate that the Seahawks are, are going to zig when everyone else is zagging. And I think, I think you're right. You know, when you bring up what you just brought up, and this is a dangerous team on the road. They could, they were within what two or three plays of beating the Cowboys and advancing. This is not a team that I want to see ever, not in the regular season, not in the playoffs. If they got to go there, we know what a hellacious environment that is in Seattle. And on the road, you know, this is a very scary team. I, I, I tend to agree with you. I think that, you know, the the value for us is going to be. Um, being able to take advantage of everything that we covered. And, you know, we've got Russell Wilson, we've got Tyler Lockett, we've got Chris Carson, and everything behind that is, you know, kind of in a gray area. So I, I, I think you've you've brought some things to my eyes that I was just lazily overlooking. And I think that I think that what you're projecting is going to be a lot closer to the truth than, than most of us are overlooking. But before we let you go, let's hop over to the tight ends. Um, not a ton to get excited about on the surface seemingly, but I know that, you know, they've been big fans of, of Nick Vanette. Do you see anything here? Um, you know, the best tight end that Russell Wilson's had was the Jimmy Graham era and that didn't go as well as they would have liked. What's what's the expectation here at, at, at tight end? Are we going to see you know a committee approach where we're going to get good stats? These guys are going to block. Anything from a fantasy perspective to keep our eyes on here? Well, uh, a lot of people are going to forget about Will Disley. He uh, I think he, he tore a, a patella tendon or, or something, but he was out the uh, majority of the, the season last year. And that was his rookie year. So uh, the Seahawks had a lot of that high hopes for him. And just watching him play, the dude can block. And, uh, I mean, the uh, crazy thing is he can catch the ball, too. So, um, I mean, Nick, Nick Van Nett is good. Uh, but I think you're going to see a, a committee approach at first just to kind of ease Disley back into it. But eventually I think we're going to see Disley being used as a, as a huge weapon for Russell Wilson. They, uh, you know, they were panicking. Like, hey, or a, lot of, a lot of fans were like, oh, Jimmy Graham's gone. How are we going to replace that production in the end zone? And then what happened? Doug Baldwin stepped up, and then he ended up filling that void. So now that Doug Baldwin's gone, I don't know. Maybe it's Will Disley. 
Maybe it's DK Metcalf. Maybe it's Tyler Lockett. Anybody can step up. I love what Pete Carroll does. He's always had a competition approach to everything. So maybe um, with Disley coming back, Van Ness going to look at that and say, hey, you know what? Um, I better step my game up. And then pretty soon you got the Van Ness showing some flashes of, uh, of greatness. So, I don't know. We'll, we'll see. It's between those two. I can't really think of anyone else at the tight end position. Uh, every, you know, all the talk is about the, the receivers and the running backs. But keep an eye on Will Disley. Well, don't and, diss Disley. And, and... <laughs> In, in your in your right, and that's in, I, that's exactly what I was doing. That's why I'm glad that you're on the pod because if you go back, you know, you bringing him up reminded me of you know he started the season. He had that I think it was the opening game. He had a couple of catches, and I, if I remember correctly, he had like a 50, 60, 70 yard touchdown that he just kind of took, you know, catching the flat, and then took it, you know, for big time touchdown. So I think you're right, and I think that that's the other thing that's you know for us fantasy players that's really frustrating is Pete Carroll wants to keep them guessing but if that were my coach you know as a Niners fan you know seeing what they're adding from an offensive perspective people are like oh it's going to be a log jam everywhere it's like I want bodies on the field and I don't want the defense to know which body is going to be making the play so from an NFL perspective and a gamemanship perspective I think Carroll nailed it man oh yeah oh yeah I uh yeah I, I can't wait I'm excited for the season um, you know, they just locked up Bobby Wagner for, for a three-year extension. So we got the, uh, the general there on the defense making the calls. Guy's, guy's awesome. So, yeah, you know, I, I think we're – Seahawks are in good hands. All right, before we let you go, one last thing, Gil. Do you have any bold calls for this upcoming fantasy season? You always got a, a, a trick up your sleeve last year. You were throwing <laughs> all sorts of head fakes our way and – you put your stamp on Barkley, and you didn't care where you had to take him. You made the argument that you would take him one overall, and you didn't have the first overall pick, but you would have taken him. And we're just like, yeah, you know, calm your jets. And you would have proved right because he was absolutely dominant. Is there anything that you'd be willing to share with our audience? That I'm willing to share. <laughs> and when I say mm. audience, I mean me. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll, all right, John. I'll give you a. I'll give you one here. I'm a. I'm pretty certain that this this particular running back is gonna gonna fall in the draft. A lot of people are gonna forget about him, but Darius Geis, I think, is gonna have not really like a Saquon Barkley kind of outbreak kind of thing, but you know, I think he's. I think he's probably on pace. He's gonna be a good comeback player of the year candidate. I like. I like Geis a lot. You know, and it's funny. I, mean, I liked him last year, but well, it's funny you say that because I was like, "Oh yeah, he's back," and he was he was a little overhyped for my liking last year. And you're right; when guys get hurt their rookie year, they tend to be overlooked the year after because everybody thinks that you know they're they're scared. And I think the the best thing going for for guys is Adrian Peterson. I think that people see AP, and it's like let's not forget that this is the guy that washed out in New Orleans and Arizona. And they basically had to call this guy and bring him in off the street because they were so desperate with injuries last year. So I think that AP being there, I think I saw Geis go like in the seventh round of a draft. And I'm like, if Geis is there anywhere fifth, sixth, seventh round, I'm, I'm happily taking him. So mm-hmm. I'm probably going to take him if I have him in front of you. So sorry, Gil. Thanks for telling me all your secrets. <laughs> That's fine. I'm just Maybe kidding. I told you that so that you would take it. And that's the me. thing. Gil is the master of head fakes. Well, <laughs> Gil, Gil, I really appreciate you, buddy. This was, this was really fun. This is really eye-opening. This is exactly the type of insider access that I wanted to get to just, you know, I don't want the cookie cutter stories, you know, and, and it's funny for as fanatical as, as we as fans can be and people want to say like, oh, this guy's a homer. It's like for as much as these as much as we like our teams, like we can tell you more than anything else what we hate about them. And I think that that paints a very realistic picture of, hey, I'm excited about this, I'm a little nervous about this. Overall, this is what it looks like. So I, you, you brought it, man. You you, you kicked butt. I, I really appreciate you being here, buddy. Yeah, man, anytime. Thanks for having me on. And uh, go Hawks. Yeah, go Hawks. See you in a couple weeks, man. I just booked my flight for the draft and really looking forward to see you, man. Woo, me too, man. Looking right, forward to it. Love Can't you, buddy. Wait. Talk to you soon. I'm 
And that's going to wrap it up, everybody. Thank you for everybody that tuned in on the Twitch. Thank you, everybody that's been commenting and liking everything that we're doing. Really appreciate you guys. I don't expect you guys to do any of that, but if, if that's what you guys are getting out of the content, I really appreciate you being able to do that. Thank you so much for all the support we've been getting. We'll be keeping it going. We've got another podcast scheduled for Tuesday, and we'll keep the NFL previews peppered in in between. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in, and I'll see you guys next time. God bless.